Okay, folks, let's get going. This is going to be week three in our series through the Gospel of John. And thus far, what we've been doing is we've been laying the groundwork for approaching John's Gospel. We haven't quite gotten to the beginning yet. Okay, so one thing we did was we talked about how do scholars understand the Gospel of John? What are the structures that are built into his letter that we want to know are there? Because when we see them, when we know they're there, it's going to help us read the gospel better. It's going to help us understand the totality of what John is trying to communicate. All of the letters in uh, the four gospels and the book of Acts do this. We just have to be aware that they're doing it. And when we do, what happens is we have a a more enlightened experience. So what we're going to do today is then we're going to talk about um, what scholars refer to as the four senses of Scripture. Now, these four senses of Scripture, or the four ways that we, and when I say we, that's both the church and Jewish scholars, this is the way we've read the Bible and the way we've interpreted the Bible so that we can derive meaning from these ancient scriptures. Okay, so generally, it's four categories, four senses of scripture, and you'll see both Christians and Jews have four. And to start off with then, what I want to do is a quote from one of our church fathers. It's Augustine. Okay, and this comes from a writing that is called Christian Doctrine or Christian Teaching. And he's going to talk about how do we interpret Scripture? What are the rules? Okay? So he says, There are certain rules for the interpretation of Scripture. Okay? So notice that. How do we interpret Scripture? Well, we've got some rules. And then he says, Which I think might with great advantage be taught to the earnest students of the Word. Okay? So if you really want to learn the Bible, you can learn these uh, rules for interpreting Scripture. Now, why? Well, so that they may profit not only from reading the works of others who have laid open the secrets of the sacred writings, but also from themselves opening up such secrets to others. Now, there's a lot in here, but look what he's saying. There are secrets, things that are hidden, okay, within the sacred writings. And what do we do? Well, there are certain rules that if we understand the rules and we follow them, they will open up then those secrets. We'll be able to see deeper. We'll be able to, our spiritual eyes will see deeper into the text. We'll have greater insight into the text, which then helps us understand God, our place in the cosmos, Jesus, Jesus as the Christ in the heavens. So, Scripture's hard. And throughout thousands of years of people attempting to derive meaning from the Scripture, we've come up with these certain rules. So, these, of course, are, we're going to be calling them the four senses of Scripture. And again, for as long as people have had these ancient documents, and this, is, this starts back with the sages of Israel, the priests of Israel, they're pouring over the Torah, they're pouring over the other writings in the Old Testament. They're trying to understand the dynamic nature of God's Word. They're trying to derive God's will for the nation of Israel. And this goes right up to and includes Jesus, his disciples, Paul, all the New Testament writers. They're looking at that Old Testament, and they're trying to now figure out God's will in light of Jesus. Okay, Then we go to the early church. They're going to do the same thing. Right? And there have been methods or principles that have been more or less adhered to as ways that you discuss and you debate meaning. What does the text mean? What does God want us to understand? You know, obviously, we can't agree, right? Because as Augustine said, he points out, there are mysteries, there are secrets inside the text, but we use tools to mine those, to go deeper. And so, as best we can, we seek to understand, to gain insight into God's Word. So what we're going to be talking about is what's commonly referred to as the four senses of Scripture. Now, it's really 
four senses of how we read, how we interpret, how we derive meaning and understanding from these ancient sacred documents. Okay. Now, there's a word that many of you may know, perhaps you don't. When you talk about the interpretation of scripture, it's hermeneutics. And hermeneutics is actually the study of the methodology and the principles of interpretation, right? What methods do we use to derive understanding from the Bible? And we could add another word here, exegesis, because they're related. And exegesis is the actual interpretation of Scripture. So you're looking at an ancient language that we have to bring from, say, Hebrew or Greek into English. How do we translate a sentence? Because a translation is also interpretation. And then hermeneutics then says, okay, well, if we say, what does it mean first? What is the exegesis? And then what does it mean for us? How do we interpret it? Okay. So we've got these two together, and that's what we're going to be doing today. So sometimes when you look up four senses of scripture, if you Google that, you will get the word hermeneutics. That's the principle, the principles that draw out meaning. How do we derive meaning? Okay, let's go to them. These, by the way, are on the handout. There's a handout at our website. It'll, it'll be linked below in the YouTube video. Look in the uh, description section. There's always a handout linked down there. Download that handout because you'll want to have all these notes so you can go back and reflect on this, okay? So, four senses of Scripture. I'm going to do both for Jewish and for Christian because, as it turns out, each group has four senses of Scripture and those four senses pretty much line up. Okay, oh, I will say this, though. The Hebrew is much more robust, okay? It's much more robust. And I'll be doing an entire separate video just on the Hebrew side. That'll be my next lesson, okay? Because it's really important. If you want to understand Jesus, the Gospels, Paul, the other New Testament writers, then you need to understand the Jewish side of this because that's what they're doing to interpret the Old Testament. And so when Jesus is in his ministry, there is no New Testament. He's only using the Old Testament, and he's using these rules to interpret the Old Testament in light of his incarnation and ministry. So do the gospel writers. So does Paul. Okay, so that's why you want to know that Jewish side, and that'll be a whole separate lesson. So let me uh, just go ahead and list them out, and then I'll walk through them one by one. So at, at first, we have on the Jewish side, you start with number one, Peshat. It just means literal or direct. Then you have one, Remez. I'll give you the Hebrew words, and in the next lesson, you'll see more why. Um, Hebrew, Remez, it, it means to give a hint or an allegory, or there's something symbolic going on. Then we have drash. Now, you guys are already familiar with this. You don't know it yet. Drash means to seek or inquire. That's a parable. A parable is a drash. A midrash is what it's called. And then the last one, sod, which is often translated secret or hidden, but I'll show you there's a nuance to it in a minute. So these are the Jewish four. And in the next lesson, what I'll do is, it's really cool. They may, there's an acronym here. You take the P, the R, the D, and the S. The word is PARDS. And that creates an acronym, but it also then gives you a picture of what you're doing when you interpret the Bible. Okay, that's the Jewish side. And again, next video will be on PARDS. Okay, then you go to the Christian side. Well, turns out you can kind of have the same four. Literal. Start out with literal, always. You go to allegorical. It was very popular within the early church. Number three tends to be the tropological. That's moral. And the final one, anagogical. And that's spiritual or mystical. Okay? Now, in the early church, or I'm sorry, even all the way through the Middle Ages, let me put it that way, through the Middle Ages, there became a standardized way that a priest would put together a sermon for a Sunday uh, church service. 
And the sermon would basically follow this outline. It would start here, literal, you know, in the beginning. And they would give you the literal sense of the verse, whatever verse they're going to talk about. And then they go down the list. And they look at any allegories, and they look at any moral lessons, and then they end with the spiritual lessons. So this has been going on for a long time. And every Sunday, you would hear all four. It's not like you pick one and you stick with it, or you never go to the, to the moral or the anagogical. You do all four, okay? So let's go now. What I want to do is just take you through each level real quick and try to help you understand a little bit about it. So the first one here on the Jewish side is Peshat, means the literal, surface, or direct the plain meaning of the text, okay? Now, of course, on the Christian side, you're going to get the same thing. So both of them are literal. What's the plain meaning? But we have to realize something here, because before we jump to, I'm going to read my Bible literally, we have a problem, because even when we read literally, we can end up disagreeing and in debate. And you might think, now, why? How can that be? Well, first and foremost, this is an ancient document, and it's written very different than we communicate today. Okay, so different cultural standards and different cultural ways of communicating. And then the second part to that is there are so many genres within the Bible, particularly if we're looking at the Old Testament, but also the New Testament. And so something as simple as, what do you do with a narrative? maybe the story of Abraham and Isaac. It's Genesis 22. Abraham is told by God to sacrifice his son. Take your son, the one whom you love, and sacrifice him. They go up the, the mountain, God provides a sacrifice, and then God intervenes. You know, you could just read the literal story, but then what do you do with it? Because you'd say, well, why did God want us to know this story? Why did we keep it? Why did he want this story to be communicated to us as part of our spiritual history? Is there a deeper meaning for us? Right? Because remember what we're trying to do. We're trying to interpret what God wants us to know. So God communicates through narrative, but the communication is not on the surface. So we can read it literally, but we might miss the point. You know, does he just want us to know that it happened and that's it? Or is there perhaps something about walking in faith? Or even as you get into the Christian era, we come up with something called types, that Isaac is a type of Jesus. And there's all kinds of similarities between Jesus and Isaac. Now you would say, but that's not literal. I know, but it's there, and we can see it, and we can apply it to our faith walk. Okay, another one might be as simple as commandments, right? Commandments are often easier to understand, do not lie, but they can be difficult to put into practice, right? Particularly when the commandments start to involve the greater community, like matters of justice are not to be executed by the individual. They're done by the community. And so now everybody in the community has to agree. If God says to have the death penalty, well, then what method are we using for the death penalty? And that's the same debates that we have today. So what about like a psalm? You know, psalms aren't commandments. So you don't want to, you don't want to read the, a psalm like you do a commandment. And what's really interesting about psalms is that, you know, you have, um, and the Lord spoke, do not lie. Okay, well, that's coming directly from God. But psalms are different. Psalms are a praise from a person to God. And so we call them the very word of God, but they're actually derived from the human condition, right? We would say inspired, no doubt, and they took on significant meaning over time. But, you know, it's often a poem um, or a song to sing. And so then how do you understand the poetic imagery that's going on? Do you read a psalm literally or do we read it symbolically? Uh, same with the prophets. The prophets often use 
like poetic parallels? Do we take literally the figurative language of the prophets, which is often symbolic? So you can see immediately, literal can get away from you, depending on what you're reading. And I think even more importantly, as I mentioned, what about a parable? When we get to the Christian era, what do we do with a parable? Because by definition, parables are not literal. Parables are made-up stories that illustrate a point. And so if you read a parable as literal, you are now misreading the text. And so parables are actually, when we get down to number three, drash, drash is number three, to search. A parable is a midrash. Parables are used as a hermeneutic for understanding something from Scripture. And so you get my point. Just because we're reading literally doesn't mean that we're necessarily going to agree on what the text is telling us, right? And whether there's something there or not. And when you immediately get into some of the more complex forms of of writing, then it's harder and harder for us to read them literally, okay? But you start with literal. Let's go to the next one. Now, we have to remember, because what are we trying to do? It's a method of interpreting what scripture is telling us, right? We have to derive meaning or it's useless. And so when you get to this one, remez, it can be a hint. And there's different ways that they recognize hints in the text. It could be an illusion. It could be an allegory. It could be a symbol. Okay. And this tends to get more complex, of course, because you're not simply looking at the literal text. You're going to look for the symbols beneath it, or the symbols within it, or the allegory within it. And I mean, we could use an example like, say, the Exodus. You have the Passover lamb. And so if you just read it at the surface level, you say, well, God commanded them to get, take a lamb, sacrifice it, place the, du- uh, the blood on the doorposts, and then they're delivered. But is that the only way we read it? Right? What if we read it symbolically? What if we consider the symbols of lamb, of blood, of sacrifice, of being passed over the angel of death, of being in bondage and released from bondage? And then we say, oh, look, later in in our Christian scriptures, Jesus is called the Lamb of God. Oh, wait a minute. But see, now now we're on a completely different level. So this has gone beyond the literal text. And now we're looking at the text symbolically. And we can say, oh, I was delivered from the bondage of slavery because I was covered in the blood of a lamb, that God delivered his Passover lamb. So it tells a much greater story that we derive out of those ancient scriptures. Okay. And and again, the New Testament writers, I mean, Jesus, his disciples, Paul, they're using these techniques. They're using the Jewish techniques, especially to interpret that scripture from the Old Testament. Okay, so they're going to interpret the Old Testament in light of Jesus. And they're using things like remez. Okay, then you go to the church. Now, on the church side, we would call it allegorical. And the early church, tended they tended to do a lot of allegory. They would interpret scripture as if it was applying to their present situation, or they would read an allegory in there into the text that's not really there. So sometimes when we read the interpretations now of the early church, we would say, well, that's really kind of far off. We might not be comfortable with some of the things that they said, but that was their way of doing it. They looked a lot at allegory. Okay, next, and this is the fun one, to drash, to seek. Drash means to seek, to inquire. And this is an interesting one because it's Jesus uses this in the New Testament. So we're going to seek something out of the Old Testament or out of the text. We're going to inquire into the text. We're going to find ways to investigate deeper into the text. Anytime you hear a pastor say, Jesus was thinking, even though the Bible doesn't say that, You've now got some kind of drash. You're seeking, you're trying to figure out what might Jesus be thinking in this moment. So, a parable, it's a type of drash, it's a midrash. And so, a parable uses a story 
We're going to draw somebody in. We're going to try to help them understand a particular biblical text or something about God or something about our relationship to God, whatever it is. But the parable becomes a tool to search for meaning. And so Jesus loves parables, right? Parables are simple stories. They engage the listener. They're easy to remember. You take them with you all day. They would be repeating in their head this parable that Jesus told, drawing out all the meaning of it, right? And then Jesus loves to add these little twists or a surprise to kind of get your attention. But the thing is, is a parable literal? No. You have to read a parable symbolically. You have to understand the symbols that Jesus is using. Now, on the Christian side, we have a word, tropological. Uh, It's simply to say, is there a moral lesson? Is there a moral lesson that can be derived from the Scripture? And it might come from anywhere in the text. It might come from narrative, or it could be in Proverbs, or it can be a prophet. Um, It doesn't really matter. We seek out these moral imperatives all the time in the text where it might not be plainly stated. And so we're doing this, many sermons are based right on this, using stories of the Bible that don't necessarily, on the surface, give the moral lesson, but we can derive one out of it, okay? Now, I hope at least at this point you can see how much of our reading and how much of our interpretation of the Bible is not literal. And even for a mainstream evangelical church today, people recognize the power of symbols that are all throughout the Bible. Now, they're always maybe a little bit more amazed as you go deeper and deeper with the symbols, but the point is, we can easily go off of the literal level, okay? But let's go to the final one. Let's go to the spiritual level, because this is really where it gets good. For this final number four level, you begin with the Hebrew word is sod. Sod is generally translated in English as secret or hidden, and it can no doubt refer to the mystical aspects of the Bible, those things that are generally hidden from our five natural senses of man. And I mean, you could even say that Christ is one of them. There's a Christ figure in the heavens that rules as a king who also died for our sins so we can be forgiven. And your neighbor looks at you and says, I don't see anything like that. I don't sense anything like that. So the secret, the hidden, doesn't mean completely esoteric, but it can mean something that's not readily perceptible to all people. But there's something more about Sod, and this is really important. This is a nuance that we need to understand. So the word means counsel. You have counsel and counsel. So counsel as a noun, that's advice, right? The advice that's given to you, that's counsel. But then you also, it can also refer to a counsel, and that's an assembly, a group of people that are going to give you advice, counsel. And so what happens is, throughout the Bible, God is pictured as being in the heavens, and he has a council, an assembly of hosts. God's not alone in the heavens. He has the angels, and he is communicating with them in the heavens. Okay? So, for instance, let me give you an example. Proverbs 15, 22. We'll look at this one real quick. So the proverb says, where there is no counsel, sod, plans fail. Right? Plans fail without, without proper counsel. Sod. But in a multitude of counselors, different uh, Hebrew word, by the way, different word for counselors, they're established. Right? If we want to establish plans that are going to function, we need to get a multitude of advice. That's a wise way of going about living. Okay, but there you see no counsel, noun, that's sowed, right? That's the advice that you've been given. Okay, so counsel. There's more though, because, and this is really key, there's an emphasis here on 
confidence. Confiding the information to you. Giving you information in confidence. God gives information in confidence to his heavenly counsel. Now, from our perspective here on earth, the confidential information is called a secret or it's hidden. So, part of what we have to come to grips with in order to be at peace with God is that God does not give us all information. There are mysteries that God keeps to him and his closest counsel. He keeps it in confidence because human beings can't handle all that information. We don't have the agency to handle all that information, even though we think we do. That's the age-old sin. That's the sin of Adam and Eve. It's the sin of the Tower of Babel. It's the age-old sin. So, some things God keeps confidential, okay? Now, he can give it to his closest advisors in heaven, or to those who fear him, the righteous person who follows and gets close to God. God will disclose information. So here, in Psalm 25, verse 14, the psalm says, The Lord confides in those who fear him. There's the word sod. He makes his covenant known to them. Okay? So that's how God uses that word. What's he confiding in you? Something that you didn't know before. So now here, I just want to show you, here in the NIV, the Lord confides. Kind of sounds like a verb to me. The Lord confides. That's not really what the text says. The only verb is he makes known. But if we go to like the, uh, the, the New King James, here's one example. This is, so the first one is from the NIV. But you go to the, what it more literally says, and that's the New King James. The secret, that's the word sowed, the secret of the Lord is with those who fear him. So that word sowed is a noun, secret. And then you would ask, well, how did the, those who fear him get the secret? Well, now you go back to the NIV. The Lord confided in them a secret. This is the whole point, though. It's given in confidence. So when we think hidden or secret, it's not something that can't be known or God doesn't want you to know. This means it's something confidential. And so what happens to us, as we're enlightened along that path, that process of enlightenment, we ought to be learning things that you didn't know previously, right? Because God is sharing more and more in confidence with you the realities that exist. And there most definitely should be a difference between a mature Christian and not mean someone who's old who just became a Christian, but someone who's been a Christian for a long time and walked with God ought to have greater insight than a brand new Christian who doesn't know anything. Solid food for the mature Christian versus milk for the brand new Christian. Why? Because as you grow with God, he shares in confidence information that you didn't have previously. That is sowed. It's the deepest level of increasing your spiritual awareness. This is what the mystic is after. And, you know, from my understanding, this is exactly what many Christians are after, even if we don't use the word mystical. And this is where God speaks directly to us spiritually, not just in the literal sense, when God speaks through his word to our spiritual level. We perceive with spiritual eyes at the level of sod. Okay, now on the Christian side, we have a word, anagogical. Now that's a Greek word. It often would get translated as something spiritual or mystical side of, of Christianity. But the word comes from the Greek word anagoge. And what does anagoge mean? It means to climb or to ascend upward. And folks, this is what so many of us strive for. When your spirit engages God, it ascends naturally. 
When you read a piece of scripture and that piece of scripture speaks directly to your soul as if God was speaking directly to you that day, your spirit is lifted and agage. And now you're reading on a spiritual level. You are way off the literal. Okay? But we experience that so often when reading the Bible. It gives you a lift. Let me give you an example from John. This is John chapter 9. God willing, we'll get there in a few weeks. But this is where Jesus is going to heal a blind man, a man born blind. He's going to spit into the mud. He's going to rub the mud in the man's eyes. And then he sends him down to the pool of Siloam to wash off. It's an amazing, when you see the context of what's happening, this is the process of enlightenment. Jesus is the light of the world who's bringing light to those who can't see. Okay? Now, you could start off literal. We're going to read this story as a literal story of Jesus healing a literal blind man. True. Okay? But do we always read it that way? Is there more? Is it possible that we also recognize that there's something that's telling us about Jesus that's transcendent, right? It transcends that particular time and place that Jesus gives sight to the blind, not just then, but he continues to do it today, okay? What about spiritually? When we read this story in John, how does it impact us spiritually? Can we identify with the blind man? Do we recognize that once, maybe it wasn't that we were physically blind, but we were spiritually blind, right? In the story, it's so great because people keep saying, how did this happen? He says, I don't know. And then he says, look, the one thing that I do know is I was blind, but now I see. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. How do we read this story? This story in John, we want to read it on all the levels, but especially on the spiritual level, because it lifts our spirits, knowing that Jesus opened spiritual eyes and has opened our spiritual eyes and continues to open them as I grow with God and become more enlightened to the reality that exists around me, that I see the presence of God in more things in life. Jesus wants to continue to open your spiritual eyes. That's how we read the story. And that's exactly what's supposed to happen. I mean, it's even crazier because John, you know, John has a very, he has an audience there in Ephesus and greater uh, Asia Minor that he's writing to. And they're in a situation, okay, Jewish believers, and they can identify with this story, even though they've never met Jesus because they're being persecuted and kicked out of the synagogue by religious authorities who are themselves blind to the reality of Jesus. And so when these Jewish believers in Ephesus, or any of the other cities close to there, when they're asked, how did Jesus open your spiritual eyes? They would respond, I don't know. But the one thing that I do know, I was blind, but now I see. So this is far deeper than we can imagine. So if we're trying to read John only through the literal lens, which has happened in certain um, schools within Christianity, is to only look at the critical, historical, literal lens, we miss so much of what's going on with John. So how are we supposed to read the Bible? Well, just as the church has done for thousands of years, We're supposed to read at the level of all four senses of Scripture. They're all, well, they might not all be applicable to every single verse in the Bible, but your goal is to search out the meaning. That's how we derive meaning from it. We want to understand Scripture at the deepest level that we can. And then, through that word, sowed, counsel, we receive the secrets from God He reveals those layers that are currently hidden to us, okay? So, these are known as the four senses of Scripture. 
How do we interpret what's written in this ancient text? This is not easy. And these four ways of looking at Scripture, they've been around since Jesus' day, at least. They had all kinds of rules for how you interpret the Old Testament. This is how Jesus and the Gospel writers and Paul, that's how they looked at the Old Testament. And then the church, the early church, for 2,000 years, this is how we've read the Bible, okay? And this is how we should be reading the Bible as well. And it does take some education, it does take some awareness, but it is totally worth it when the Scripture speaks directly to you in that mysterious way that only God can do, because He's God and we're not. And when you get that spiritual enlightenment, it's like manna that feeds the soul. The word lifts us up, anagage. We ascend little by little towards that union with God, that union with our metaphorical bridegroom. And as we ascend bit by bit, God confides more and more in us, deeper aspects of his will. And that transforms us. It's just like a husband and a wife growing together when they confide in each other. And what this does, the power of this, is that it gives us testimony. We don't have to prove God to the world. God's doing fine all on his own. We need to give our testimony that speaks to the soul. So my prayer for all of you is that you would dig in deeper. Let your soul be lifted up by the words as you go layer by layer, deeper and deeper into the biblical text.